to do this in two parts for, to help Chris out here. The first is going to be the history and what's here. And then I'll do part two, which will be collecting and bogus military police shotguns, of which there are numerous. And what to look for, because these shotguns that we have here, they have, in, the prices have been so inflated in the past couple of years, as people just went crazy over them. Part of it is, okay, in the 1960s, you had the movie The Professionals with Burt Lancaster, and they used 97s. There was the Wild Wild Bunch. Then later on, I think in the 70s or 80s, with The Wind and the Lion. And this week, Ripper Street on BBC America, they're running around with 97 riot guns in London. Okay? So the demand for that particular model has just skyrocketed. And there's a lot of bogus ones out. And, and there's the, the Norinco copies, which are sold for what they are. It's a copy. And yesterday, I think I was at Heritage, and I think I sold one for $600 in the Norinco riot gun. So if anybody wants one. All right. During the American Revolution and in New Jersey, you were required to have either a musket or a fowler. Okay, a fowler was your early shotgun. The difference between a musket and a shotgun the musket could take a bayonet and was a combat weapon. The fowler was more of a sporting. But both use the same thing. You could put one big solid lead ball down the barrel, or you could put shot down the barrel, or you could combine the two and create what we call buck and ball. In the War of 1812, the United States government issued buck and ball for the first time as, as a standard issue combat round. And that hung around for quite a while. If you go to Gettysburg, there's the buck and ball monument the new would correct me if I'm wrong. 14th New Jersey? 12th. 12th New Jersey? Okay. They used buck and ball as late as Gettysburg, 1863. And they have a monument to the buck and ball. Yeah. Stan, buck and ball load for the model 42 smoothbore became the standard. It's harder to find a single 69 caliber round ball cartridge. Mm -hmm. if, if you look for a buck and ball, they're all over. All right. The government stated for the 42 smoothbore, Buck and ball was the standard round. Standard combat load. Now, after the Civil War, two things happened. One was we went to cartridge firearms and we went to more restricted bores. We were going from 75 caliber to 69 to 54 to 50 to 45. So now you were really challenged if you wanted a gun that could use both. You really had to split the shotgun away from the rifle because of the now we're boards. So in the Indian Wars, there's pictures of General Crook, I think his name was, K-R-O-O-K, and he's carrying a double barrel shotgun on his mule. But a lot of those were issued more for foraging or finding extra food to supplement the rations that didn't arrive, okay? As a combat load, the shotgun limitations were, of course, the fact that it was usually a double barrel firearm at most, but there wasn't much capability. Yes? Uh, no. Fowlers you were talking about, yeah. they seem to have exceptionally long barrels. Yes. Even longer than a musket. Because, again, they were for getting those flying birds at higher, you know. But you were allowed to have one. If you didn't have a musket, bring your fowler. And basically, one or the other under the New Jersey Militia Act of 1775. That and a steel ramrod were, you know, part of the items that you were required to have. Now, with shotgun development, in the United States was getting somewhere. Winchester wanted a repeating shotgun, but Winchester wanted something that was lever operated because levers were Winchester and Winchesters were levers, okay? That was their trademark mechanism. But eventually they get John Moses Browning and he designs a pump shotgun, the 93. At that time, most of the shells were black powder. So when smokeless was getting more and more common, he developed what's called the 97, which we have numerous examples of. That's the popular old gun. And the thing about it is, fine, in 1897 it was top of the line. By 1912 it was obsolete. <laughs> but they were still making them as late as 1957 because the market demanded it. People liked the 97, despite its flaws. Now its first combat use is in the Philippines. And what they did, was they used what's commonly called the riot model, okay? 
20 inch barrel cylinder bore and they were issued in the Philippines and they were also used in the Mexican punitive expeditions in 1916 and when World War One broke out there was a demand for a combat shotgun for the US military and what they wanted to do was stick with improving designs like the 97 but they wanted something that could handle a bayonet because the bayonet was still considered a critical weapon so Springfield Armory and Winchester got together and created a combination handguard bayonet attachment. Now, this here is the Noreco, and it is a very good copy of what Winchester made. First of all, all Winchester trench guns, which is a term we use for them, the military just called them shotgun with handguard bayonet attachment. We call them trench guns. All of them were solid frame, and there are so many dumb, uh, bogus trench guns out there, but all the World War I guns were solid frame if they were made into a trench gun, take down if they were made into a riot gun. The problem you're going to run into is they weren't marked. When they left the Winchester factory, that was it. After the war, they hand stamped them, U.S. and an ordnance bomb, on some of them. Many others were then given to National Guard, and one case in Virginia, the Virginia National Guard went and sold them to the Richmond Police Department, and they had them for another 70 years. And then when they unloaded them, you know, collectors swarmed on them because they were government-issued World War I guns, many of them had never been used. They sat in, in racks inside the Richmond Police Department. But a real problem for, for people was finding one with provenance. Because all we know is they fall in a certain serial number range. And 80% of them, at least, were never marked. Okay? Now, if you look at the action, you see how it comes back here and drops down here. There's a lot of opportunity for grit and crud to get in there, all right? I mean, it's, it's a browning design, and it was top of the line in 1897. When the Winchester 12 comes out, that is so much smoother, sleeker, less areas for dirt and grit to get into. You would think this would just be obsolete, people would forget about it. Winchester kept making these till 1957, 60 years of production, because people wanted them. Police departments wanted them. I don't know if there was a price differential or what. Now, the First World War, only the 97 solid frame trench guns got sent over. The Winchester Model 12s didn't make it over. So if you're a World War I fanatic, that's what you want. Now. This gun here was made in 1917, okay? It's got the original blue finish, but it's a phony trench gun, which I'll get into later on. And it's marked Fort Lee PD with a nail. So that's not exactly good provenance. You'll find some of these where it's really nicely engraved. I still regret not buying a Westchester, Westchester County Sheriff's Department 97 that was beautifully engraved on the side with that designation, all right? Okay, World War II rolls along. And the war to end all wars, we got rid of our shotguns and things. Although one little side story, in September of 1918, the German imperial government goes to the International Red Cross and complains that the United States is engaged in war crimes because our troops are using shotguns. And they are threatening to execute any American soldier found with a 97. Their argument is you're using soft lead bullets. That's a violation of the Hague Convention. You're not using full metal jacket. Now, this is the same government <laughs> that introduced the flamethrower, poison gas, unrestricted submarine warfare, and strategic bombing of civilian cities. Yes. And they're pissed off because we're using shotguns. <laughs> so it was the French that introduced the yes. gas from flamethrower. Yes. The French used yes. gas 
but a non-lethal gas, and the German technicality was, under the Hague Convention, you were not allowed to use shells that used exclusively gas. The German first solution was, they released it from canisters and let the wind blow towards you. The second one, they put an explosive charge in the shell. So it went boom with shrapnel and the gas came out. So as far as they were concerned, it was not an exclusive gas shell. It was an exploding shell with gas. That's, that's for another time. All right? Now, World War II rolls along, and the United States decides it wants shotguns. Well, the Model 12 and the Model 97 had proven themselves before, but there was this massive shortage of shotguns, and that is why we have so many to look at across the room. Uh, where's Dave? Right here. Dave, want to talk about the uh, blanket procurement and other things that are there? Just like Stan mentioned, they didn't have a lot of shotguns during at the beginning of the Second World War. So what the government did, they went to all different sporting goods stores and even they asked for donations just from the citizens. So people would donate their 20 gauge or 16 gauge, whatever they could find. And what they called the purchasing of these shotguns, you know, through the retail stores was the blanket procurement. So we don't care what it is, just get us something. And this is one of those guns because it's actually an Ivor Johnson 12 gauge, and it's actually US property stamped with Norman's bomb on the side. So even though you may be at a show and it's like, oh yeah, you know, it's a little Ivor Johnson. <coughs> some can have some provenance to it. Yeah. So that's why it's pretty important not to pass up some of the non-military uh, style like the Model 12 or the 1897. So blanket procurement pretty much ended in 1943, but they still had a lot still left over in inventory. Now, considering that during the war they were training guys with broomsticks and phony machine guns just out of blocks and dowels, they needed as much as they can. So that's why they started with blanket procurement. Okay. Now, during the Second World War, there was a demand for combat shotguns, shotguns for, I guess, running Japanese into internment camps, uh, POWs, and for combat. But they also needed to train people in aerial gunnery. And that's where a lot of these long barrel shotguns that we have here, which I don't want to get into, military finish, uh, were, were purchased. And some of them, and I've even seen some of the guns have like big screw holes on the side, they went to a special mount where you would actually make believe you're behind a 50 caliber. And they would mount this on a deuce and a half. And they would drive down the road, and along the road they would set off clay birds and you would swing and, and put the butterfly to fire the shotgun to teach you the fundamentals of, of leading, all right? And, of course, after World War II, with the introduction of jet planes and everything else, no more aerial gunners. So a lot of those guns are going to be sold after the war just to get rid of them. And they flooded the market after World War II, and only three shotguns are going to be retained, officially. The Model 12, the Stevens 520-30, and the Stevens 620, is it? 628. Yeah. Those were the only three official shotguns after World War II. Everybody goes, I had a 97 in Vietnam, I had a 97 in Korea. Maybe they did. Officially, there were going to be three shotguns were going to be kept. The rest were to be sold off. And they flooded the American market with used shotguns. And I'm going to get into the Richardson guns. All right, I'm, I'm going to have to walk around this table here and have better access, but Dave's got what it's marked Navy, property of the United States Navy. Uh, he's got the Remington here, nice blue finish. Uh, this one here that I had, it's got the FJA stock, everything else, has a cuts compensator that was probably added on. Some of them left the factory with a cuts compensator. And the way you find them is there's no marking on the barrel as far as choke. 
This one is marked cylinder, CYL. So they probably added the cuts compensator. They also have on them a US and ordnance bomb and the word military finish. It's more of a brush blue. This one was parkerized somewhere along the line. It's got an FJA ordnance marking in the stock. And these were once fairly common as surplus guns. And for those of you who are not familiar with this ancient device known as the Cuts Compensator, there it is going to fight me today. Yeah. 600 cuts to the inch. Yeah. You can change the choke. And you got this big bulbous thing on the end. And I remember seeing pictures. I think they were very popular in the 1940s and 50s was to have a shotgun with a Cuts, comp a cuts Compensator and the change the choke by changing the the end here and there's a little wrench that comes with it that I don't have now there's also riot models because all you got to do is change the barrel but we'll get into that later on over here is a World War II original 97 shotgun the way they were made when they left the factory they had the US already put on them they had an ordnance bomb on the barrel. All right, there was a stock marking. Either, this one here, I think it's GH, this is WB, I think. Yeah, they had the stock marked and, you know, took a sling. There was no band up here. There was a projection on the end of the magazine cap that goes into the, into the bayonet catch. Now, this one here has six rolls six rows of holes. This was the early guns and also the World War I guns. They then went to four rows of holes. In the now, hmm? In the no, I'm oh, sorry, on the heat shield. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Holes in the barrel, no good, no good. All right, yeah, on the heat shield. And these guns were, you know, fairly, uh, I started collecting in the 1960s. There's a guy named Jack Gordon in uh, Linden. And he had at least a dozen of 97 guns for sale. Unfortunately, they all were reparkerized after World War II, and they had this blackish finish, okay? Ones that have been refinished go for like half the price of the original, sometimes a third. It diminishes their value dramatically. If you can get one with original blue, that's the way to go. Uh, the bayonet. It's the same one, and this is going to be an issue that I'm going to talk about later on. When Winchester was making these, they said, well, we're already making these bayonets, so let's make it fit the 1917 bayonet. In 1945, the United States declared the 17 Enfield obsolete. The bayonets were used as late as the 1980s because tradition, shall we say, legacy of the First World War was that's the bayonet that goes on the gun. Now, you're Display of bayonets there, you see the scabbards are leather. First World War, they were leather, most of World War II. They then made a plastic scabbard, similar to the one that's used on the Springfield. All right? Now, we're going to well, get to Vietnam. Okay, when the war is over, there's a legend about the Philippine guerrilla guns, so that's why I brought them here. These were made by a company called the Richardson Company. For anybody who thinks that gun rolls will work, you got to take a look at one of these. It's got, let's see, this is one part. That's part two, part three, the bolt is part four, the stock is part five. The wing nut's not necessary. Five parts. You can go to Home Depot and build one of these. It is one of the most simple guns, and I saw one built when I was at the MP basic course. They built one for us just to show us how easy it was. They took, a, they took a pipe that was three-quarter internal diameter that fits 12 gauge. They then took a pipe that was one inch external diameter that took the pipe that was three-quarter inside. They took a, a blank 12 gauge shell. They scotch taped a BB to the primer. They put an end cap on one of the pipes. They then shoved this in and went and it went off. That was the mechanism. <laughs> This guy Richardson had been a, a PT commander, or assistant commander, anyway, his PT boat got shot under him and he ended up in the Philippines, and he watched how people built these guns. 
And after the war, he thought it was a neat idea. There must be a market for these things. He was wrong. But anyway, <laughs> he made two models. And this one here is stamped in the woods. Gorilla gun, patent pending. I doubt he got a patent for it. But over here in the wood, it goes Richardson Industries Incorporated, East Haven, Connecticut, USA. Uh, no serial number, no proof marks, nothing. All right? And he made this very simple gun, which was supposed to sell for $9.50. And somebody estimated he could make them now for probably $75. And they didn't sell. <laughs> so he thought maybe he needs to make a, a, a quality version. <laughs> Alright? Oh, the advanced model with a forward pistol grip. My god, this pump, if this was semi-auto, this could be a Jersey illegal assault weapon. Alright. Um, <laughs> this is not the trigger. This sets it off. This is the safety. It won't go off unless I pull this. Then it can go off. Sometimes. Sometimes the safety doesn't work. I just put the safety on. Theoretically, you could load it and gently put it down, and now you can walk around with this. And then if you wanted to fire it, pull the trigger and slam it. <coughs> Hopefully you slam it hard enough and it, it goes off. Yeah, you're okay. going to fire that. And this also didn't sell. The advanced deluxe model was also not a seller. The reason I bring this up is every now and then you'll get somebody on the internet and go, rare Philippine, OSS Philippine gorilla guns. Airdrop to our allies during World War II. <laughs> Things were made in 1946-47. It was a novelty, and these stupid novelty guns now go for 400 to 800 dollars. You fired that Sam? No. <laughs> huh? Never fired it. But I've watched YouTube's where people doing it. You know. Okay. When the war is over. Uh, shotgun development for the military didn't go anywhere because the attitude was, we have enough of these guns. We got the, the Model 12 over there, the Stevens, and Rich has got another Stevens riot gun. The United States did not want any semi-automatic guns. They, they didn't trust them. They wanted that reliability of the pump. So those go into the, to the arsenal. 1950s, okay, during the war, they had also acquired some Ithacas, which I'll get into a little later. Okay. This is an 870. We didn't really buy these for our military, but Britain did. During the melee insurgency, Britain realized that a shotgun would be a good combat weapon for them. The problem was they couldn't find anybody in Britain making pump shotguns. In the, in the English world, Dastardly weapons here. Yeah. You can fire more than two shots. Definitely not sporting. Okay? Again, they have a different culture. If I was in Britain and I want to go hunting, number one, I better be a member of the upper class. Number two, I probably own a bunch of double barrel shotguns. And most importantly, I'll have my servant with me when I go shooting. So when I take my double, go bang, bang, I just hand it to him, he hands me the other double. Bang, bang, I hand it to him, he's ready loaded my first one. All right? So there was no mass production of pump shotguns in Britain. As a matter of fact, in Britain, when they started outlawing assault weapons, pump shotguns were definitely on the list. So Britain had to buy Remington 870s, which are very good. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to the police part. Remington has two bars to push the bolt back, while Winchester only has one on one side. And that was Remington's claim is we have two, it's more reliable, it's a smoother action. And these became very popular as police shotguns. Now, the police department I was on, they wouldn't buy these because they cost too much. So they bought us high standards. And they also bought us, at least in Ithaca. A lot of police departments bought the Ithaca. Now, during World War II, our government bought Ithacas, then decided Ithaca's better at making pistols than making more shotguns. So one of the mystery guns on this table is going to be this uh, Ithaca. I think only 1,500 were made in World War II. And they're ultra rare, expensive. They'll be at Rock Island auction, OK? Vietnam rolls along. 
the Navy SEALs like these. And they, they bought a bunch of them in the 1960s. This particular gun has all that, has an ordnance bomb, everything else. But the serial number makes it 1972. So I don't know what the story is. It's got an ordnance bomb. All my reference books say we only bought them in the 60s. On my, in the police department as I was on, these were issued because they're good for lefties. This is a very solid, lightweight gun. That's the only hole you need to worry about. Yeah, you load it and it ejects that way. So if you're a lefty, okay, it's not a problem. You're not throwing shells in your face or anything else. And the Navy SEALs liked them. They had some special ones made where this cap goes up to here so it, the tube can hold more. But this is an Ithaca made in 1972, all right? Now, on the table over down there is a Steven 77E, is I got that correct? Yep. Now, all the books will tell you that was the most used shotgun in Vietnam. They were issued out to the South Vietnamese, and they all stayed there. Obviously, we have a mythical one that has appeared on Rich's table, okay? He's got a U.S. model 77E. Uh, they got the bid. They, they produced the lowest bid. And thank you, Rich. You want to talk about it or all? Or? Uh, okay, well, a couple things that are unusual. They all have this dark stock, this dark wood. I'm not sure why. Uh, but the another thing you notice, even without putting it to your shoulder, is the butt is a lot shorter than a typical shotgun, isn't it? Okay, why? Because it was made for the Vietnamese. I'll explain okay. that one too. <laughs> so they also, uh, this is the only one that I know of, there was no shotgun, military shotgun, riot gun, trench gun, before this that where they put a rubber butt plate on it. Right, so rubber butt plate, that's the standard one. I hope this one ever goes because I'll never replace it. Uh, but uh, this one doesn't really get shot too much. Uh, but it takes a regular sling. Now they had this in a riot configuration, all right, so it doesn't take the bayonet. And they also had it with the hand guard uh, and the bayonet. Those I've never even seen. Uh, but there were 69,000 made, almost all of which went to Vietnam. Some went to like Philippines, a handful, a handful went someplace else. But they all went to Vietnam. And if you go to Vietnam, last I heard, uh, they're still doing tours where the Vietnamese show you all the warehouses with these guns all <laughs> stacked up still in the warehouse, showing off all the, you know, the Americans left all these guns behind as they ran away. Uh, so that's where they supposedly all are, but there were 69,000 of them. Uh, this one must have come back with the soldier, I guess, somewhere along the way, snuck, uh, uh, smuggled back. But uh, nice little guns. Uh, there was a commercial version of the, of the gun also, but the things that really tell you that it's authentic is the serial number range, the uh, fact that it's U.S. marked, uh, and also this kind of dark wood with this weird butt plate on here. Okay. Now, during the Vietnam War, they needed bayonets again. And of course, remember the 1917 bayonets were all made in 1917 and 1918. Okay? So all of a sudden you need bayonets again. So what they did is they put out contracts and there were two companies, I think it was in Canada, and they started producing the new 1917 bayonet. It's very crude compared to the World War II, uh, World War I guns, and they come with their own plastic scabbards that are similar to the World War II scabbard. A lot of these uh, bayonets are hard to find because they demill them. And I have one, and they cut them right there. They took a welding torch and cut them right across. So you, you can end up with the handle, and I forgot to bring mine. I have one with just the handle. Uh, but every now and then they pop up at gun shows. Now, I was in a divisional military police company, 502nd, at Fort Hood. We had no shotguns. TLNE did not call for shotguns. I joined the National Guard, and I joined the 50th MP Company, which is a divisional MP company for the New Jersey National Guard, and we had six Winchester 1200 shotguns. And every one of them had a bayonet handgun and had these bayonets. But there's a little notation. They were pre-mobilization only. If we were ever federalized, they stayed behind. So the shotguns belonged to the state of New Jersey and to the Patterson, later East Orange, maybe later the Somerset Armory. They were not part of our federal equipment. If we were to be called up to Fort Dix, leave the shotguns behind. But every one of them had one of these bayonets. They're checkered plastic. And again, it's a legacy item. Here we were in 1970s, 
with a 1917 bayonet. Why? Because tradition had made it the, sh the bayonet or the shotgun. All right? Later on, they started modifying shotguns so they could take M16 bayonets, and Newt Meeker has one that takes an M5 bayonet for an M1 Grand. All right? But as late as the 1970s, 1917 bayonets were still the issue bayonet. All right? Over here, okay, Dave, can you explain your Mossberg? In the 1990s, the government started going to doing more tests on shotguns. What's going to replace the 97s? 97s haven't been made. Okay, They're, they stopped making them in 57. The Model 12 is too expensive. The 1200 is the cheap version. So the government went out and said, let's test who can give us a good shotgun at a good price. Go ahead. Yeah. Now this is the Mossberg 590. Pop action shotgun and very similar to the Remington, it actually has the two bars on the side for the four stock. So that way it would increase reliability, etc. Uh, the government actually did tests on these and it went for so many thousands of rounds without jamming. And that's why they chose this Mossberg. Obviously synthetic stock for the butt. The four stock still has the ventilated handguard, and the nice thing is it can take an M7 bayonet on the end, which is the same one you'll use on your M16. Now, I like this one because it's granted, it's only a 20 inch barrel. You can hold nine in the pipe, but when I go bird hunting, I take this one. Why? It's synthetic, I can beat the living snot out of this thing, and I get a lot of birds because I'm my own dog. So if I got to go through, you know, through the weeds, through the thicket, any type of briar patch, I can put my bayonet out. <laughs> try to get that bird if I had to. But otherwise, it's, it's a great all-around shotgun. It's never failed me in the field, even in the cold. I've never had a problem. It's always gone bad. Yes. Ah, yeah, the hole in the buttstock. You can actually put shells in here. You can put two on this side and two on the, on the other side. But I do not, I'm not sure if the military actually prohibits this or not. I believe they have to have a, a solid, solid stock. Okay. This is another Mossberg 590. They had a couple different variations. Now, what happened with this one was I went to Heritage Firearms and it was in the rack and the guy goes, yeah, guy ordered it and when he looked at it, he didn't like it. So they, they dropped the price down. It was mil-spec, military specification for the civilian market. So that's why it doesn't have a nice fancy blue finish. And it came with a called Ghost Ring Sights. And it, it's a very nice gun and I wanted a heat shield just like that. Only to find out that for whatever reason, Mossberg makes this gun in such a way that you can have the ghost ring sights, but you can't have ghost ring sights and a heat shield. Okay? And it too takes a modern bayonet. In this particular case, I have the Marine Corps combat knife, the new Marine Corps combat knives, which fit an M16 or an M4. And you can see the Marines are a little nastier than the Army because they got serrations here and stuff like that. Uh, but that's the Marine Corps combat knife. Uh, the Marine Corps has gone from a bayonet knife to a knife that you can also use as a bayonet, is really what it comes out to. But this gun here, I get to fire it, it's still got all these nice stickers on it, mill spec, everything else. If you're looking for a quality firearm, but you can't go wrong with this. this these guns took an abusive test and beat everybody else's uh, pump guns, and I think they still retail under $400. And if you go to a dealer and you tell them you want the mill spec gun, like that one or this one, you know, they can get it for you. And it's, you know, Parkerized finish, it's never going to win a beauty contest. And it holds nine rounds. Now, I always get this, isn't that illegal in New Jersey? Okay. It's a pump. If it was a semi-auto, yeah, it'd be an illegal assault weapon. But because it's a pump gun, no, you can, and it says nine three-inch shells, which to me is an awful lot of firepower, you know. Now, Lately, the Marines and the the Marines I know, the Army maybe, are going to Benelli's. 
For a long time, the military would not go for a semi-auto. They just felt that we can't trust them. We want to be able to grab that thing and pump it back each time, make sure it ejects and fires again. And there were some experimental guns. I'm trying to remember, anybody can tell me, it was that one gun that was a pump and a semi, a SPAS or something, S-P-A-S? You could fire it either way. You could pump it or you could go semi-auto. I think they rigged it up so the pump would work the semi-auto action. So if there was a jam up, you just pumped it. If not, you just get pulling the trigger. Which brings up another item. Um, does this have a disconnect? No, it does not. It does not. Okay. The topic of a disconnect is, comes up every now and then. Uh, some shotguns have a disconnect, which means you have to release the trigger each time in order to fire it. So number one, it's empty. Okay. I can fire it, pump it again, or I can keep the, hold the hand, hold the trigger back, and then just pump. Then we'll fire each time. So you can you can just pump the ammunition out. The bad thing about the 90 seconds, besides the fact that you got all these parts that are protruding out of the gun that can get crud into them. This particular gun is responsible for the hole in the wall of a friend of mine's house. <laughs> he was a police officer at Elizabeth, and he thought it was the neatest thing in the world. So he was sitting at home, loading it, and playing around with the half cock safety. There's the half cock safety. Except his went. <laughs> so he, mom wasn't home. He put the gun down. <laughs> Saw where the hole was, moved furniture in his bedroom while he tried to figure out what he was going to do. <clears throat> Unfortunately, his mother comes in the next day and goes, oh, that's really nice of him, redecorate. He probably forgot to clean behind when he moved the furniture. <laughs> so, of course, she moves the furniture and sees this nice rat hole <laughs> in the wall. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you manage to stuff him into it? Yeah, but, um, you know, he's a police officer. That's if he excuse certain things. Anyway, um, with these guns, this is the historical part. Anybody else has something to add to the historical part? Then I'll get into the, maybe the collecting and the bogus part, which we run into with the... Uh, Did you say that the, the Mossberg has a disconnect or doesn't? You no, fired it, right? Disconnect. No disconnect. So you can do the same slam firing. Um, good point. I know some guns have it. Some guns, let's see. No disconnect on, on, the, on the Ithaca either. I'm trying to think of anything for uh, books to get. 1942, the government printed this is a reprint. One of the most useful books you can ever get is called Shotguns All Types. It's an, actually, it's an Army technical manual from September 21st, 1942. Because first of all, it's got a full page of all the different guns that Uncle Sam had to worry about when they did blanket procurement. Okay? So you got Winchester 97, Winchester Model 12, Stevens 620A, 520, 620, Ithaca Model 37, Remington M10, Remington M31, Remington M11, Savage M720. All right? And it gives you detailed information on how to take them apart and clean them and fix them. Uh, another good book is for collectors only, Joe P uh, Poyer. Real good, nice, easy book. But the best book everybody thinks is was Canfield. You got Canfield's book? Yes. Canfield's considered the expert on, on combat shotguns. And a lot of US World War I and World War II. The guy really is a prolific collector and writer. United States Combat Shotgun, Bruce Canfield, a complete collector's guide. And uh, again, the demand for these things has gone crazy. I'm going to go into part two in a while. We'll talk about, I have guns here that are bogus because I built them, put them together. And there's guns here that, that question marks. And I'll, and I'll talk about the question marks. Is that? Yeah. We're talking about books. Oh. Uh, there's the, the older Canfield book. There's also a newer Canfield book that expanded completely and changed the names. <laughs> like second to so uh, they're actually both. And it's hardcover, so it charges more. Charges more. But it's actually in more content. But if you're interested in not just. Classic. 
Yeah, this one here, which is the world's fighting shotguns, also covers shotguns throughout the world, not just the U.S. guns. So it's also kind of interesting. But I mean, this is probably out of print, but it's a really good book. For a while, that was the only book you could buy was fighting shotguns. And again, any kind of collecting field, it's you know, it's it's, it's bad. You you don't collect till the book comes out. The book doesn't come out unless people are collecting. You know, and then only information comes out. Any questions? I'll try to answer them before I go through part two, which is modifications, bogus guns. Yes. Those Enfield uh, bayonets you were talking about. Uh huh. You used with the checkered. Uh, right, checkered plastic. Right. I mean, how did they? Did they have attachments were different? Or how, no. Are they standard attachments? They were, you put them on a 17 Enfield. I mean, they were. They just realized that they had. They they they, they ran out of the bayonets in the First World War, and because of a legacy. They kept making shotguns with a bayonet catch for a bayonet that was no longer used. You would think they would have modified them a lot sooner. I remember I was at Fort Bragg in 1980, and I ran into a shotgun at a store where, that took an M16 bayonet, but I never found out the story behind it. And Fort Bragg, that's where Special Forces operates out of. The pawn shops in that area, the stuff that shows up, <laughs> And if only I had been smarter and had more money. Uh, one gun that I kicked myself in the butt for that I passed up because it looked kind of cruddy was a North Vietnamese made SKS. Very, very rare. And I looked at it as a piece of crap gun. Look at that. Look at that. I can probably drag through the Mekong Delta. You know. Probably was, but uh, I don't think there's too many in this country. Yes? Stand of cartridges. When, when did they phase out the brass rounds? Oh, okay. Uh, brass, want to talk about brass rounds in World War One and Two? Yeah, sure. Got some bad, please. Let, let the man at the collection talk about it. Well, during the First World War, they used mostly paper cartridges. Even though this is not a World War One paper cartridge, they still had the same problem. They were going to get stuck. You know, they wouldn't cycle properly, so they finally decided to go to a full brass shell. Now, this is a World War I from, uh, I got the information from the Cartridge Collectors Association. I believe it's also known as IAA. And what they have mentioned is that when you look at the top, it's marked double O buck, and it has a very, very, very thick lacquer that's orange on the top. This particular one is made by Remington UMC. It has number 12 and best underneath. And it also has a dark, bluish, purplish type of lacquer around the primer too. So that's how I believe this is World War I. Do I know 100%? No, but from the information, that's what I believe this one is. However, the majority of the brass ones didn't go overseas. By the time they, you know, made the production and everything, it just never, never got over there. I'm sure some may have, but the majority of them still stayed in the country. <laughs> and of course, you still had you know, some police action here in the United States, such as in 1921, you had the Marines who were actually guarding the mail trucks. And what they ended up using, I'm just going to go off on a slight tangent. They actually used pouches like this, which is the 38, but it was actually marked USMC, and it actually had a full band around here to hold the 12 rounds inside. And that was a 1921 pouch from the Marine Corps. Now, that was the only time that any type of shotguns were used, with, you know, with the exception of banana wars and stuff, but here in the U.S. Whether they used the brass left over from World War I? Probably, but it's not known. But going over to World War II, a lot of the guys left the, the Ordnance Department and, hey, you know, we have all these shotguns, quick, 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 let's get some shotgun shells. Well, they came up with the same problem. They still had the paper shells. So they didn't retain or learn their lessons from World War I. So, 
they did have different manufacturers. They had Peters, they had Western Cartridge Company, and they would produce buckshot, you know, for the combat purposes. And if you notice on some of the, the boxes, it would be stamped with a P for proof. Others actually said U.S. property, as this one. And the same thing here with Western. They had nine pellets, a double little buck. These were paper. And finally, they decided to come along and make the full brass one. Now, the nice thing about looking at the brass to know if it was military is you actually see it's actually rounded along the top. Whereas if you have a commercial, it's just straight. So it's actually contoured over and rounded. Yeah, exactly. It's a crimp on the top. I'm sorry? Yeah, it is for performance reasons because when you think about it, if you have a little bit of crud inside the breech, you don't want something that's going to be exactly contoured to the inside of the breech. So this way, it will definitely go in, and it, once it fires, okay, it's going to it's going to expand, just like Joe has on some of some of his uh, shells here, and you can actually see that there's a little bit of rim, you know, from the crimp that actually expand it. So they will definitely work. So it's, yes, it is a performance thing. And the other reason they put the crimp on is to hold the wad in and hold the shot in. <laughs> <laughs> because these things get abused and kicked yeah. around. And God knows what happens to them before they get shot. That's true. Thank you, Will. And also, the top <laughs> wad is also marked. That's another way to tell. But there's, you can go into different variations upon variations on the the different types of shotgun shells and who actually made them. Okay, what, what did they mostly use for combat load? Combat load was uh, three grams, one, one and an eighth ounce, and double O buck. That's I mean, double O buck. Nine, nine pellets, it's two and three quarter. Double O buck is what they use. Yeah? Yep, yep, double O buck. Yep, that was considered the combat round. And of course, they still made. Uh, training rounds, you know, they did it for, for trap or ski, and of course the aerial gunners that Stan talked about. And that's what these particular loads are, right here. You'll see like number eight, chilled shot, all the chilled means that it has a certain amount of antimony in there. Not all that. Dave, hey, can you tell us anything about the, the flechette rounds I made for Vietnam? Well, unfortunately, no, I can't tell you about the flechette rounds. I don't know anything about it, but okay. the flechette rounds, I've seen them, and I saw the flechette action. They were like tiny little nails with a fin on the back. And uh, when they were putting artillery pieces, they were called beehive rounds, because they made like, a buzzing sound when they flew out. And when I was at Fort Benning, they fired 105s into targets for us with beehives, and you, you could pull the little nails right out. And they made it for the M79 grenade launcher, the M203, and they made it for the 12-gauge shotgun. There was also in Vietnam what they called the duck bill. That was a Ithaca with it. The idea was is the shells, okay, we know the spread of shotgun shells. They go out like in a giant circle. The duck bill forced them out laterally. And the idea was why waste the rounds going high and low? You wanted them to go out sideways. And uh, I don't know what happened. Duck Bill was there. They experimented with him. Then it's never mentioned again. So probably doesn't work. It's probably the, the, the answer. But uh, that was one of the many experiments with shotgun. The problem with the shotgun has always been the, the shells are big and it takes a long time to load. You want to talk about some of the the, the uh, grenade pouches from the First World War, Dave? Yeah, sure. the, the, the Marines came the closest to a solution. Yep. Actually, you can actually see on Canfield's book, you'll actually see a uh, Marine on uh, Okinawa carrying his Model 12, and he actually has a grenade pouch, just like the one that Joe brought here. And what they would do is they would actually take all their shotgun shells, their combat loads, and just put them right in here, right in these pouches. 
And when you think about it, you can hold a lot of shells and never fill these things up, never had a need to, but it's a heck of a lot easier just to carry one giant pouch of ammunition than it is for a bunch of boxes or to put it in one of these little shotgun pouches that hold as well, which is the M1938 shotgun pouch. One of the interesting things is Mills belt. You have a Mills belt, and the nice thing is actually it's actually marked over here, Mills 2, but there's no military marking, nor is there any other procurement information on these particular belts. This one actually holds 25 rounds. There's other ones that actually hold 32. But with the 32, they actually have grommets where you can you can hold your, your bayonet onto. It was slipped through. This one doesn't. Also, the ones with 32, you can actually have your the shells, you'll see that out of the bottom, sticking out the bottom. So myself, I can only guess that well, the majority of the guys during the First World War were probably a lot skinnier than I am. I mean, I got a size 40 waist, I'm almost 50 years old, so I'm a little pudgy around the chair. But when you think about it, I can actually put this here relatively easy around my waist. And if I actually had another set over here, you can actually tighten this belt up for somebody with a skinnier waist, and you won't have to fold these pockets down in over. Now, it's okay, these will slip over the belt, the belt buckle, you know, with the shell out, but it just makes it a lot easier. But that's just one of my observations. Dave? Yes? The uh, Mills belts uh, were also private purchase. Um, sometimes the buckles came, for instance, with a, a dog's head at the buckle uh, for private purchase. They weren't always the U.S. issue. Correct. So, you know, that's, uh, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And some of the other things you'll notice is that there is a date stamped on these. It's Mills Patent in April 18, 1905. That's what you'll see on these in particular because, again, you can you can adjust them with the little holes to any size you want. Why was it like? Okay, carrying the ammunition, uh, this is Vietnam issue and probably current issue possibly. It's just a nylon, it's the same pouch when it's made out of nylon. And it holds the rounds that way. Uh, when it comes to ammunition, if you go to Cabela's and you ask them for mil spec double O buck, they sell it there. Because I guess Winchester produces enough of it. And it's usually cheap. It's like five dollar, four dollars for a box of five rounds compared to usually a dollar a round for buckshot. But they're green, and there's no polished brass. It's like they're, they're cheaper than that. I've gotten them for like three bucks. Three bucks, the Cabela's. Cheap, yeah. They they don't look pretty. They're, if you want to play Pancho V and you want those big red shotgun shells like Arnold Schwarzenegger wears in Commando, sorry. <laughs> you know, these things are subdued looking. They, they, they just blend right into the uniform. If you've got a bandolier, no one will see the shiny brass or the bright red. It just, it's double old buckshot plastic. And again, with plastic, you didn't need brass anymore. Paper shells were the problem. Once you went to plastic, you didn't need all brass. So all brass starts to disappear. Yeah. What was the combat shotgunner's role? Were they strictly military and police, or did they actually perform in the field? They were in the field. The, the, the thing is, like the Marine Corps was told, you, you get 100 shotguns per division. How do you use them is up to you. Some people preferred to carry a shotgun, okay? Um, yeah, where's Newt? Now, welcome to the back, okay. Larry Farrell used to be a member of this club. Uh, he was, a, uh, I think, an advisor in Vietnam. He preferred the shotgun. He used to carry a Stevens. He, he, I didn't find out what model, that's why I was going to ask new. But uh, I guess he was given a choice of weapons, so he, he, he grabbed a Stevens for whatever reason. Stan, you know, you know, later on, earlier when they used them, a lot of times they used to shotguns, like in the Philippine insurrection, they were used as cover weapons. Mm -hmm. 
because some of the guys were still on the trap door spring fields and things like that. And a guy with shotgun and squat basically just pump off rounds. Right. Give, give protection. I mean, that was earlier. As time progressed, it really wasn't necessary for that. Right. A new event that we've okay. added this year at the VJ Day shoot is, was it sniper elimination we called it? Whatever it is, they'll permit you to use. Really? Yeah. Now, when we first were running Armistice Day shoots, we used to have these used to called Doughboy Action Shooting. We had a thing called Trench Assault. And what you had to do was throw two dummy grenades, you had to advance with the shotgun, fire five rounds, and then you had to bayonet the target to stop the clock. Okay? And yeah, we had a lot of fun, but that's when we had our own range and we had 100% control over whatever wacky things we wanted to do at the range. Yeah, you okay. were 15 years younger, too, dear. Yeah, that's right. We were also 15 years, uh, 20 years younger. And uh, we, we used to call it Trench Assault. Uh, we're sort of bringing it back this year for VJ Day by calling it Sniper Elimination. And as always, since not everybody has the proper guns, we make sure there's some loaners available. So bring ammo. Okay. Don't forget the pumpkins we used to kill. Oh yeah, we used to shoot the pumpkins and, and bayonet them too, but that's another story. But, uh, and we used to throw grenades and they were two types. We had the pineapple painted orange so we could find them again. <laughs> Mark twos. Mark two. Yeah, Mark twos painted bright, uh, you know, Omaha orange so you could find them. them yellow and correct. Yeah. And then we had homemade potato masher grenades from stuff at Home Depot. We used to assemble these things out of plastic so you could, for those of you who had to play Central Powers, you know, you, you had the potato masher grenades to throw. Oh, yes. In, in a sniper event, did you draw lots to see who was the sniper? <laughs> Climb in the tree and let's see if we can take you on. Right? Um, make sure you're tied in, I know. Tied in tight, okay. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else here. Can we get some more questions before I go to part two, yeah? Yeah, how effective was the shotgun in the first world war and why did the enemy get into the trenches with with the uh, allies at the same time? No, no, the idea was the trench shotgun was really, to get, once you got into the trench, you could start clearing it by firing left and right. And was it effective? The Germans obviously thought it was because they, they filed a formal complaint, said they would execute anybody caught with a shotgun and Pershing said, then I'll start executing Germans caught with sawtooth bayonets. Uh, even though, but at that stage in the war, the Germans had gotten rid of the sawtooth bayonets, as I explained to you before. Uh, but that was in September. November, the war was over. Now, if you're a lawyer with nothing else to do and you're watching this at home on your YouTube, you know, that might be an interesting case to, to dust off and, and run to the Hague and go, it's a shotgun, a legal weapon, you know. But then I'm going to mess you up because the Taliban and ISIS and all the rest are not signatories to the convention anyway. So. <laughs> but the enemy got into the trenches? I don't, I've never heard of it being used defensively. Or anything I've heard. I've used them on assault. Yeah. And when it came to Vietnam, everybody keeps saying, oh, we had 97s, we had this. The one picture they keep showing is a member of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, I think in 1964, and he's carrying one of these. Okay? And remember, after the war, the Model 12 and the two Stevens guns were theoretically the only issue shotguns. But again, I can tell you in 1972, my MP unit in the National Guard had Winchester 1200s. And they were very crudely sling swiveled, but they had the uh, checkered bayonets. That, that was there. Yes, Lou? I understand we used to teach riot control with those things in pedophiles. T neck armory. T neck armory? I do know we used to go, Lou and I were in the same unit, the 50th MP, and I do know that, uh, I forget the Provo Marshal, he wanted us to go up to Picatinny every year and, and just do familiarization firing with the uh, 1200s. And that's all we did was, you know, boom, 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 does it work? Yeah. Some of the guys were really good. I, mean, I remember guys who would obviously were shooting more than we were because they would load it up. Okay, and all you had to do from familiarization fire was fire without hitting somebody, you know. You know, friendly fire is such a drag. Anyway, they would fire it, then they would eject the shell. As the shell flew up, they blasted out of the air. Show offs. Show offs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a couple of comments on the collecting aspect. US military shotguns, I think, have gotten to the point where they're 
luxury items. Yeah. Very expensive. Uh, things that are still not that expensive, however, are police shotguns. Yes. Police shotguns and the variety there that you look for is the marking. Mm -hmm. All right, and they tend to be also more modern shotguns that have just come out of the cars because they've replaced them with something else, or out come the shotguns and then go the uh, MPR schemes, <laughs> and MPRs, right? Uh, so you look for weird things, like for example, this particular one right here, uh, it's a Mossberg uh, model uh, 518P, it's a militarized uh, Mossberg model, uh, but boldly emblazoned on the side is Surete du Quebec Police. So you can get like your local police mm -hmm. or your state police or collect whatever you want. I thought this was cool because that's a folding stock uh, and it is, uh, you know, kind of a rust-free finish. But this is what they used to carry in the province of Quebec. Uh, but they, I guess, went to M4 yeah. or whatever they used, uh, so out they went. So the police shotguns are actually still, I think, a bargain. They're still affordable. <clears throat> yep, and you can get some strange markings, you know, Tulsa and this, and, you know, state police. Uh, so that's kind of cool to collect, and they are still affordable. Uh, and by affordable, I mean, uh, I don't know, 300 bucks. There's also the ones from, uh, go to Pennsylvania. you got to remember, Pennsylvania and West Virginia, there's a lot of shotguns that were owned by union-busting mining companies. And some of them will have, you know, you know. Like Pinkerton? Yeah, well, not, Pinkerton would be an interesting one to get to, get ones that are marked Pinkerton. But you might get one like, you know, Blue Mountain Mining Company, you know. Or you might get a, um, an armored car service. That's another one. So you get armored car services that shotguns uh, engraved or emblazoned. The one, you know, the one police gun, I got two police guns here that I know are police guns. But one of them, Fort Lee PD, it's made with a nail. I mean, I could take any shotgun and put on it, you know, New York City Police Department, you know. You really want one that's, I hate to say it, either a good fate where it's nice and engraved by a jeweler, you know, or it left the factory and, it's, and you, you have a factory letter saying, you know, this gun was sent to New Haven Police Department. Or you have the bill of sale when they sold it to, when they turned that in and all their revolvers to get Glocks, you know. In the 1980s, 1990s, when I was on the city council, I think we arranged to get rid of our two Thompson submachine guns, which we were never going to use and a bunch of revolvers, and we, they were going to give us MP5s and Glocks. Now, they were glad to get these antique, legally transferable, lifting-y toys to sell to other people, and the taxpayer came out ahead because, you know, you, you're not going to send your police force out with your 1921 Thompson, okay? Bad PR. And um, that's a highly collectible item. You could probably get a dozen shotguns for it, you know, or an Uzi or two. Any other questions before I get to part two and bogus guns and things to look out for? Anybody? Anybody? Kind of like that guy in uh, Dr. Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know? Anyone? Anyone? All right, then. No questions? Then I'll, I'll start at the other end down here and talk a little bit about bogus guns. And because, because they've become such expensive items, um, God knows what's been happening. I, I look at Rock Island sometimes and I'm going, I can't afford the guns I own, you know. Um, let me start. Is my, rebuilt? Yeah, the rebuilt 90. Let me, go, let me start with the refinished um, Winchester. The one with my friend with the hole in his house. Okay. Um, I bought this, I checked my records, 1967. In, uh, yeah, oh, back in the old days, yeah. I'm going to my 50th high school reunion. That tells me how old I am, okay. Um, they had a whole bunch of these in the store. The guy was very big, and I, I bought one that looked nice. And remember my friend who managed to put the hole in the... He also dropped it. And he broke the stock. So, well, those days, going to Sarko in the 1960s and early 70s was like going to Bannerman's in the 1920s. There was no fake crap. It was all the real deal. So we walk in and we go, do uh, you have a stock for a 97? You want GI or commercial? GI. The gun had a commercial stock. Brings me this stock with the inspector marking on it. You bet. Restoration. It gets put on the gun. Simple as that. All right? Now, there were dangers because he had a lot of stocks and some of them were there because they were cracked. Uh, the last Allentown show, which I missed, but a friend of mine was there, 
Somebody tried to sell him an original 97 trench gun takedown. According to its serial number, it was made in 1924. It had a green finish, but it had a stock with the inspector mark on it and a crack here and here. And the guy wanted $1,700 for it. Okay, he didn't buy it. First of all, they didn't make them in 1924 for World War One. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. First, back to the future. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Rock certainly had to transport it back. Number two, it was a takedown. Now, all the trench guns made for World War Two are takedowns. There's two serial numbers on, it, so you can take the two parts apart. But the World War One guns were were solid frame, like the Norinco copy, and the Norinco copies are a real good copy. But you know what they are. World War I, America did not buy guns from China. Okay. So this gun, I consider a restoration by putting the right stock on it. All right. But again, because it's refinished, the value drops dramatically. Another example of a bogus, of, of, well, example of a bogus gun. And the reason I know it's bogus is I'm the one who did it. This gun started life in 1917. So this is a World War I era gun. The thing was, when I bought it at Greeley's gun shop in Cedar Grove, was that my buddy loved mine. And he said, if you see one, get one, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll buy it from you. So I walk into the store, and this gun's hanging there. And I look at it, Fort Lee PD, the whole bit. So I think it was $65, whatever it is. I buy the gun. And then, of course, my friend gets into a divorce, and he can't do anything. And I realized later the gun said mods. This was a hunting gun. This was a long barrel. It has this, uh, except this section here that attaches it to the barrel, which is not done on riot guns. I mean, on trench guns. Trench guns don't have that, the originals, because they lock up to the uh, bayonet lug. But uh, this is just a commercial hunting gun. So I have this thing. And I can even see the barrel's been cut at an angle with a hacksaw. Okay? So I cleaned it up so it became 19 and a half inches. I think it was like 20 and a half, 20 and three quarter inches, okay? And, hey, it looked better as a trench gun. Go to Sarko. Where else, right? So we go to Sarko, and he sells me a, you want blue or parkerized, you know? And blue, blue, the gun's blue. So he gives me. This. Notice it's plumb in the front? That's a sign that it's a savage. For whatever reason, their color mixture, you get this purple here, and you got one, two, three, four, five, six rows. All right? Um, okay. So it goes on <clears throat> this gun, and we use it for years for doughboy action shooting. It's just, you know, just a fun gun to play with. A couple of years ago, one of our members tells me, I've got the shotgun I don't want, uh, $125. I didn't even look at it for $125. So I end up buying this gun. I go home, and I'm looking at it. It's got U.S. government markings on it, U.S. It's a Stevens 520, everything else. I'm going, but it has no, no bayonet lug, no nothing. All of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, out came the screwdriver, and this one was restored the way it should be. Now I'm stuck with that gun. i got to buy the Chinese reproduction gun handguard. They're all over the place. You can get Chinese handguards for 100 bucks. If you want to build your own trench gun, no big challenge. Believe me, the, the parts are everywhere. Now, strange guns. Thanks to look for this, and I'm glad you brought that Stevens, because see the stock color? And guess what? It's about a half inch shorter. So I'm really wondering if this is not a Vietnam gun. This particular gun is a 97. The serial number puts it in the First World War. And it's got U.S. formally engraved on the bottom. Now. The ones that the Army kept, they stamped U.S. and put an ordnance bomb. 
But they gave these to the prison system, the postal system, the Marine Corps. God knows how many different agencies ended up with these guns. This one has the great parkerization that was common in World War II. The butt plate is aluminum or steel, and it is like a half inch shorter than the standard issue uh, butt, uh, butt stock. It has a professionally done swivel. I added this myself. It's got three notches. And when we got the gun, it had no bead. So somewhere there might have, somebody might have along the way, an armorer or whatever, made it into a trench gun and just slid the heat shield on it. Then for whatever reason, the heat shield was gone and when we got this gun, the bead was gone. So we put a bead on it because the chances of finding a heat shield are kind of minimal. What happened was Sarko originally had originals, <clears throat> parkerized or blued. Well, as the demand for these guns went up, Sarko had a lot of demilled ones. And I'm not giving any secret. If you read Poyer's book, he'll tell you. Sarko admits they did it. They went out and, and contracted with someone to make heat shields for them. They would often use the original front end, and then they would uh, weld the heat shield on. The original ones were riveted on. So you got these semi-original heat shields all over the place. Again, with this gun, who knows? It's a U.S. mark, the serial number is right, but this is a takedown, so this is not a trench gun, even though it's got the notches here for the, uh, the heat shield. So, who knows? Okay, this is the Sportsman military finish. There's no great demand for these things. Everybody wants the riot models, okay? All you gotta do is change the barrel, except there's a serial number on the barrel. So if you take it apart, it won't match this. Plus, the government bought two models. This is the Sportsman. This was designed for sporting use. It holds three rounds, that's it. The Riot models held five rounds and were not Sportsman. They were the, what's, it, what's yours, the Remington? I have the, the 11. The 11, that's a five shot, right? Right. Yeah, those are the five shot. This is a three shot. You can stick this barrel on it. If this got an ordnance bomb on it, everything else. Have the old days at Sarko. Because when I bought this gun, I said, oh, I want the Ryan model. So I went down to Sarko. you have any barrels blued or parkerized? <laughs> parkerized. Because a lot of these guns were refinished. Even though it says military finish, they originally were blue like those. But as they got rebuilt, they were parkerized. So the blue ones are, of course, in greater demand. But uh, that one's parkerized. And you know, you could, you could put this on and make it look like a, uh, a riot gun. Uh, the Ithaca down here, we're talking about police guns. This one here has an ordnance bomb on it, so it shouldn't be military. But it was made in 1973, and, and all the other sources tell me on the side is, the, is stamped in is LBTPD. My guess. And that's all it is. Long Branch Township Police Department. What's this Long Branch? The LBT. I think it's the giveaway. Long Branch Township. There is no Long Branch Township. There is no Long Branch Township? Yeah. Oh, well, Long Beach uh, Tactical Squad. I don't know. Anyway. It could be, uh, Long, Long Branch PD would be L LBPD. LBPD. Okay. All right. So whatever LBTPD is, this particular Ithaca that wasn't made in, you know, wasn't ordinance accepted. I was hoping to find out that that was one of the guns that the government was sold to police departments or something, and then eventually they traded it in, and then that's where it ended up. Um, Dave, anything you want to talk about phonies or? Uh, nothing as far as phonies go, but there is a, another thing I'm collecting. Go ahead. Okay, sure. Please. One of the things you always want to look for as far as the trench gun is concerned. You charge your wallet. Yes. You your wallet. Your worst enemy. Not only your wife. What's the work? I'm sorry? What's the model for work? Go ahead. Uh, what would you do for that? Well, what I paid for and what it's worth now are two different, really? two different things. Yes, yeah. yeah. And it's gone up, especially this one, uh, because of the, the blooming content. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
this would close, actually came out. the number, Dave. What would that be worth right now? At I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I'll tell you later. Because I, I don't want you to fall off. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, this actually came out of the arsenal down in Alabama. And I actually have a copy of some of the paperwork that actually uh, was transferred along with a whole bunch of other guns when somebody made some trades, you know, for some military uniforms. So this thing never saw any type of service, so it actually sat on a pallet with a bunch of others on, on top of one another. So that's why it's in good shape. Um, I would say extremely good shape. Uh, some of the things you want to look for is actually on the, on the bar over here. You always look for the wear. If this is extremely worn, that's one of the pieces to look out for. And of course, also on the magazine tube. That's the areas you really want to look for as far as wear is concerned. Uh, granted, you still have the external finish you want to look for. But that's really going to tell you to see how much uh, abuse the gun's actually taken. Just these two areas. That's what I always focus on. At the Allentown show about two years ago, I saw a guy open up a trunk of the car, it was in New Jersey, and he pulls out a Model 12 uh, riot gun. And I was like, wow. And he goes, well, it's U.S. Mark. And I'm like, wow. He goes, but it's mismatched. I go, it's too bad. But he goes, yeah, because I built it. I go, what's the story? This guy had bought a whole bunch of Winchester 12s. He made them into riot guns, and he went and bought dyes to stamp U.S. and ordinance on them. <laughs> But he was admitting what they were. The thing is, I am sure the people he sold it to were probably less scrupulous. And who knows how many of them are going to pop up at shows in the future. The thing is, the guy told me, he says, all these guns are mismatched. He says, I put them together from parts. Is that a Sarko employee? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I'm serious. The guy had New Jersey plates on his car. And he had them, again, he told me, he says, no, oh, I put them together, you know, for hobbyists and reenactors. And I'm sure, you know, he was being honest, for hobbyists and reenactors. But we all know that, you know, as I always point out, I have that Warner and Swayze sniper rifle that was put together. I figure 50 years from now, that gun will be at an auction with a verified letter from General Pershing saying this was being awarded to his favorite sniper, you know. Stan, Stan, they did the same thing years ago with all the crack carvings. Oh, they're all... U.S. volunteers. People had them cut down professionally, recrowned. Mm -hmm. The problem was most people couldn't get the correct site that was marked with a C. And of course, your shield number runs. But the yeah. average person doesn't walk around with a piece of paper in his pocket with the shield number. They were passing off crag rifles that were carbon, that, that were rifles that were cut for $1,500. And they bought the same rifle for nine. And they got them home and they found they weren't carbons. Right. There was also, when they made the movie Rough Riders, TNT, they had them done there in California for the movie. They cut them down. Yeah. They cut them down and made them into carbines for the movie. Okay, and then afterwards they were sold off. But you know. They were crappy looking. Yeah, they they they, they chopped the stocks and didn't finish the stocks right on them. Yeah, when, when I was a young collector, I remember reading about all these guys with fake dragoons and everything else. And I said, good thing I collect World War II stuff. Nobody makes fake World War II stuff. <laughs> Not then, they didn't. Not then they didn't, yeah. Stuart Mulberry did that book, 331 yes. Tips for the Gun Tips Collector. Tips for the Gun Collector, right. It's a book by Stuart, and it does an excellent <coughs> treatise on what's been going on, what to look for. Now, 97's the last gun show I missed, but the, the guy finally bought one, but he told me there was people walking around with 97's for $350. They were the long barrel guns. And Where's Joe? Joe Lux. You know what I'm saying? Right here. Joe, right. Cowboy action shooting did a lot for 97s, too. That was another thing that created a whole new market, was so many guys wanted 97s for cowboy action shooting. And, of course, they'd bite a long barrel, chop it down, have somebody put a bead on it, and, you know, they were happy. But, uh, like I said, this week I'm watching Ripper Street on BBC America, and they're running around with 97 <laughs> shotguns, you know. Uh, there's a website, I think it's called IMDB Guns and Movies, and if you go in there and you go 97 Shotgun, they'll list all the 1920s gangster movies and things like that, where the 97s were carried by police, prison guards, whatever. And then, you know, The Wind and the Lion, uh, The Professionals, 
And uh, Wild Bunch also had Model 12s. If you look closely, they have Model 12s when they shoot up the bank. So, uh, yeah, in that movie, then they, and then they, had the, they had the bad guys on the roof at 0383 Springfields. I know, but, you know. The what? Yeah, Long Beach. It is Long Beach Township. LBTPD, Long Branch Township. Long Beach. Long Beach, Long Beach Township. Long Beach Township. Police Department. Yes, Barbara. Yes, when I was with the New Department as a communication civilian standby officer, they were budgetizing so they could get more guys to the academy with a lot of returns coming up at the same time. The senior armor of the department was like 26 years old and didn't know squat about shotguns. And they had the shotguns and they get the new patrol cars and they didn't fit. So all kinds of temporary adjustments were made to the shotguns. They took the barrels of the side and then I'm not kidding, this really yeah. happened. Because there was a gunsmith in town. Don't worry, I can fix it. Bring me the car, bring me the shotgun. And he was a wonderful guy. And when he returned, he packed up, sold his business, and moved out of town. And this was a major problem because they bought the patrol cars, but nobody considered the shotguns. Now they have the shotguns, so they have to worry about the new patrol cars that are even smaller. Because they got the fuel loaded in the front and all this stuff. And they have to carry the oxygen in the back and the um, yeah, we, we, we know we have limited time here and people have to leave, they got families. Um, one of the things I was going to try to show you is I have a police training film from the 1980s about the shotgun and they warn you of all the stupid things cops would do. It was a training film for police and one of them was they would ride in a patrol car and they'd have the shotgun like this between them. And when they would chew gum, they would throw the wrappers down the barrel and, you know, put the cigarette butts out. And, and you know, then later on, the guy would try to use it. Why was the gun jamming? You know, well, what's all this aluminum foil sitting inside my shotgun breech? You know? And it, it was a Motorola. Motorola produced some fantastic police training films in the 70s and 80s that were not for the general public, because a lot of them were... They were scary. It was stupid things police officers do to get them killed. And my favorite was a guy who kept snoozing in the car and letting his partner do everything. His partner gets shot and they call him, okay, my partner shot, my partner shot. 10, 12, what is your location? What is your location? The guy had no idea where he was. What is your location? Look at the ambulance there. What is your location? That's for another time. No. Don't give me a cup. Don't give me a cup. No, I won't give you a cup. Yeah. I think you and Dave do not want a cup. No. Because a guy who deserves a cup deserves a videographer. That's right. Give him the cup. <laughs>